Well, uh, so I'm delighted here to have uh, Professor Dr. Soren R. here. Um, so this is one of our distinguished speaker seminar talks. Um, it was wonderful that he could join here earlier for Pablo's defense and uh, that uh, we take that as an opportunity to hear from him. Um, he uh, has a chair position at uh, University of Bonn and also um, he leads a research group at Fraunhofer Institute for Analysis and Information Systems. Um, he has done a number of work efforts in uh, social and uh, semantic web technologies. Um, so there is this big uh, European project called LOD2 uh, and uh, that in, uh, you know, the DBpedia related, some of the DBpedia related work and DBpedia Spotlight, which Pablo worked on, uh, is, uh, was funded by and was part of this project that uh, Son was the coordinator for. And uh, there were other things that you may have um, heard of. Uh, he was co-founder of uh, uh, such projects as DBpedia, SiteWiki.org, LinkGeoData, PontoWiki. So these are, you know, some of the important projects within uh, semantic web kind of community and community oriented efforts in semantic web research um, and uh, he's of course been a leader of many journals he'll be taking over in the way of IGS Blue IS uh, uh, starting next year so um, uh, I, I guess you guys are also former member of W3C right so you are a yeah. member so that's also the case and uh, you guys have seen other information from him okay so welcome uh, sorry and Thank you very much, Amit. I'm very excited to be here as well. So I think um, Wright State University and Noesis is probably Gnosis, how is it pronounced correctly? Gnosis. Noesis. Noesis yeah. is probably one of the best centers of semantic and smart data technologies here in the, in the US. So I'm very happy to be here finally, although we already collaborate for a long time and I heard a lot, read a lot of papers also, which originated in Amit's group. So. Um, that's very exciting. And I would like to talk today a little bit about uh, linked data for enterprise information integration. I guess most of you know what linked data is about, right? So I don't have to introduce you to that part, but I think that the same concepts uh, which are used for integrating data on the web can be also used for integrating data in within the enterprise. And I want to give a little bit of an overview of um, different aspects of linked data integration, what we worked on in the LOD2 project, um, and show you some, some use cases. So I have this introductory slide, why do we need uh, this data web? Um, so um, I think we should always remind us what doesn't work that well, that well why do we work on linked data? I think. Uh, the advantage of linked data is that we can answer many questions which today's search engines or, or keyword search engines cannot answer. Um, in particular, when we want to join information from different sources, when we need background knowledge to answer questions. And uh, I think we have all learned not to ask these kind of questions to Google. Uh, we only ask questions Google, Google can answer well, right? So I have some examples here. If you search for apartments close to childcare, or you search for ERP service providers with offices in certain cities, uh, or you want to organize a conference and you need some researchers in a specific topic in Southeast, from Southeast Asia. Um, these are questions you cannot answer Google. You won't get any results. Maybe you will get one if you are lucky because no researcher writes on his homepage Southeast Asia, right? They write Singapore or Thailand or Bangkok. And you have to infer that these locations are actually located in Southeast Asia um, for childcare and, and apartments. You have to join information from different sources. And these are types of queries which cannot be easily answered on the web and also not inside the intranet of, of large organizations uh, where they use uh, frequently keyword search um, in order to search in the intranet as well. So and that these are queries which can be facilitated uh, by adding such a RDF or linked data access um, to the data so that you can have more intelligent search engines. That actually happens already. There are a number of um, 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 yeah, approaches which go in that, uh, that direction, like we have a schema.org initiative uh, which enables to annotate content on the web in, in a structured way. Um, we have this Google's Webmaster snippets, there's Freebase, so these are all 
in the way uh, approaches which go towards having more structured data and integrating structured data on the web. And that's something which happened uh, over the years. So you, you see this um, link data cloud which has evolved. Uh, we stopped now drawing this link data cloud because it's uh, too big and there are too many data sets. So um, it's similar as in the early days of the web. I remember in the early 90s, everybody was drawing maps of the web, of the internet, right? Nobody does that today anymore. And hopefully we reach this uh, state now also with this web of data. Um, still, we have many of these walled gardens out there, and the aim of, of this linked data approach is uh, breaking down these walls and integrating data from different gardens and making this uh, more accessible. And um, um, approach which we followed in this LOD2 project was um, uh, having this life cycle metaphor for linked data in different stages basically of linked data. You have to extract uh, data uh, from information, for example, using Spotlight out of um, uh, texts. Um, you want to store it and query it, so you need triple stores which um, serve as Sparkle endpoints. You want to manually revise the information and improve it. Uh, you want to link it automatically. It's another project, uh, Silk, uh, which was uh, done by colleagues of Paolo in Berlin and also colleagues of mine in Leipzig. Uh, we're working on uh, LIMES, uh, two linking tools which automate the linking between different data sets. You want to classify and enrich the data with more information, analyze the quality, support the evolution, uh, repair data. And last but not least, also facilitate search, browsing, and exploration of data. And for each of those stages, I would like to uh, talk a little bit uh, about them. Uh, so extraction, um, um, we basically can distinguish extraction from unstructured, semi-structured, and structured sources. Um, and uh, we have heard a lot um, in the morning about uh, extraction from unstructured sources. So uh, like Spotlight, for example, from texts and um, using natural language processing approaches there. Um, Semi-structured sources are DBpedias, for example, uh, an example there, also in geodata or statistical data sets which are available. And then we have, of course, also structured sources like relational databases, uh, which can be also mapped to the RDF data model and then be accessed as um, RDF data. So the Wikipedia, uh, I think, was uh, covered already by, by Pablo's talk. Uh, the basic idea is not to actually extract information from the text in Wikipedia, but from the semi-structured um, elements, which are the title, the coordinates, which you have there, the disambiguations or redirects, um, different kinds of um, info boxes. Uh, that's actually the richest source uh, of information there. Uh, other language versions, which is also a very interesting resource. I'm using that myself sometimes. If you don't, uh, sometimes you have terms which you cannot find a translation in a dictionary because they are so domain specific or very new, brand new, that they didn't end up in a dictionary yet. And using Wikipedia, you can find translations for those terms uh, easily. And then the category system, and so on and so forth. Is my computer making it? No, 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 no. It's the other people like they're being kicked out from the last time. <laughs> so here is the uh, example how this works for such an info box. You see the info box notation is already such an attribute value notation, and uh, that can be relatively straightforward in a straightforward way transformed into triples, RDF triples, where you use as a subject basically the entity identified by the page in a way, the article. Uh, in that case, it's the city of Busan, and then you use those attributes in order to create properties and those attribute values for the objects of the, the RDF triple. But of course, you also see the problems there, um, like you have, for example, the uh, unit encoded here in the property, right? So for pop, which stands for population, there are actually 20 different, there were 20 different, uh, there is no standardization of those attributes. You find population, pop, Pop 2010, when the population was uh, is from 2010, or number of inhabitants, inhabitants, all kinds of variations, and uh, cleaning that up, of course, is something uh, what has to be done, and um, uh, what we do with this mappings wiki. So we have a crowdsourcing approach 
where people can actually uh, map those attributes to um, properties in the ontology, in the DPpedia ontology. And um, uh, we do that also for different languages because those attributes are also language specific. Um, in English, you have different attributes than in the German Wikipedia or in the Hindi one or the Chinese one. And that, um, that can be done using the mappings wiki. And in that, um, a DBpedia is different, for example, from Freebase. Like uh, Freebase also started by extracting information from Wikipedia, but then they basically deviated from Wikipedia. We want to stay as close as possible. We don't want to deviate. We basically, um, what we do is maybe revising those mappings, but um, we always want to be able to update our knowledge base from Wikipedia. That's the difference. Freebase basically doesn't update from Wikipedia anymore, but what they do is they have, I think, several hundred people working in China on improving uh, Freebase and adding new facts to the to the knowledge base. <coughs> I talked to Stefano Masoki, who is uh, one of the guys working in Freebase. Um, so as a result, you can query this using Sparkle language. Um, here you have the Sparkle query, and then you basically can access this information like a database, and there are lots of applications. Here is the a relationship finder, for example, they can find relationships between different entities here between Kurt Gödel and Albert Einstein. And you can find out that they both uh, lived actually in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And that was something very interesting, what I didn't expect when we started the first DBpedia version. Um, I expected that we would get nice descriptions of all cities, for example, or of certain types of people. But I didn't think that this is actually so connected. And uh, that's something that was very surprising, um, that all the information we extracted is actually well connected. Those fact boxes, info boxes on the sides, they link to other uh, entities, and the fact boxes from those other entities link uh, again to other entities. So in the end, it's really a connected graph of information, and that was in a way unexpected, surprising, and probably some um, uh, some reason for the success of DBpedia, but that was also something we didn't know in the beginning when we uh, when we just started with that. And then there, sure, of course, is it right? yeah, yeah, sure. just a quick question. So I think it's a behavior um, the, of the people, of the dedicators who are really creating those Wikipedia pages, right? So I think it's more driven by the editors, like. Um, it may not be really uh, in the any community knowledge uh, network, right? I think it's just maybe the behavior of the Wikipedia's dedicated editors, that they always make sure that knowledge that they are inputting, it's kind of well connected. Yeah, but uh, since we don't focus on the text, right? For the text, this is obvious, yeah? You have all these links in the text, right? But we don't extract, uh, we don't actually apply spotlight in order to extract information from the text. We extract information primarily from these fact boxes. And uh, you also have links in the fact boxes, but not so many. So that was something which was not so obvious in the, in the very beginning. If you take the text, of course, that's, um, that's pretty, pretty obvious, but uh, if you take uh, those fact boxes, then it was not so clear. Yeah, so now another um, area, to, so this was an example, DBpedia for semi-structured information, where we have some structure, it's not completely unstructured, but we also don't have such a highly structured um, 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 information uh, model like for relational databases. For relational databases, um, uh, there it's in a way of course easier and there is even a standardization of this process how you can map relational data to the RDF data model which was developed by this RDB to RDF working group and there are a number of different tools meanwhile out there so we started long ago developing one uh, in 2009 which was called Triplify and we actually managed to publish a, a paper at www there although it was written only in three weeks and the code for Triplify was only two, three hundred lines of code so it was a very simple approach but um, I think quite effective for converting relational data from web applications into the RDF data model and meanwhile we extended that and uh, that's what you see here in, in the Sparkify uh, which uses also has in addition to the R uh, to RML um, mapping language its own mapping language which is inspired by Sparkle and the idea is uh, to connect a Sparkle construct query 
uh, with a view from the SQL database. So here we have a view, um, basically a select query, which selects information from the SQL database, and then we construct um, an, a triple um, RDF template, which is then instantiated for every result of this SQL view. And the connection between the two is done here uh, with this bridging, where we basically connect uh, the variables or the columns of this view to the variables in the Sparkle construct. That's the, the basic idea of this Sparklify syntax. Um, and my colleague Klaus Stadler, um, PhD student in Leipzig, he uh, implemented that, especially for linked geodata, uh, which is uh, linked geodata is basically a linked data version of OpenStreetMaps. Who of you knows OpenStreetMaps? Yeah, most of you. That's and a great resource, right? But it's extremely large, very structured, but a very, very large data set uh, with, um, I think, billions of, of facts in there. So that was really challenging in order to deploy such a mapping approach. And that's what we developed this um, Sparklify for. Um, and that's also currently in use, basically, to um, provide a linked data endpoint for uh, for this OpenStreetMaps database, which is a relational database, a Postgres, PostGIS database in the back. Just a unique uh, relational database uh, as a Sparkle endpoint, what does that, what value is that? Um, the value is, for example, um, I will come to this in, in the enterprise, right? So uh, if you look in large enterprises, you have thousands of relational databases. And if I tell them, uh, you have to use a triple store and you convert your, your data into triple, uh, they throw me out of the room immediately. Yeah? So they, don't, they want to stick to the relational databases. But of course, they need to integrate information from different relational databases. And then uh, linked data provides an added value because you have identifiers for all the data items, for all the columns, for all the entities in the database. And then you can actually link two relational databases to each other when you have the Sparkle or Link Data interface. So are you using mainly for mapping? So you have the relational database, but you add the mappings in the RDF format. Is that what uh, you add? The value add? What is the value in terms of integration? Is it to the mappings or something else? It's, I think, uh, adding, having identifiers for, uh, like, worldwide unique identifiers for every okay. uh, data item. Okay. And so then, of course, the mapping that you reuse mm -hmm. um, identifiers also for the schema and for the uh, for the dis metadata for the description of the. See, the, po the point is a, a. Yes, you potentially can uh, uh, make uh, relational data web addressable by this mechanism. You know. The other thing is uh, that you could do the basic mapping. Is your foreign keys you have, uh, which is a very limited type of mapping. You can specify more uh, richer mapping stuff. Yeah. If you want, you can even add metadata, like transformation rules and all that. I remember uh, in 80s, we used to do work on database integration. Mm -hmm. And we used to work at schema integration levels, and we used to work at the instance integration levels. And then there were multiple forms of levels of integrations. Uh, so in one case, um, something's equivalent to something else. In the other case, I may have to map to a uh, function, right, right. or I may map through a table lookup. So there are, I remember a variety of uh, richness of the mappings there were, including use of a computation to map something in foot with something in meters. Yeah. Uh, that could be a simple function. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be a table lookup where uh, three stars are mapped to good and five stars are mapped to excellent. So yeah. there'll be a table that kind of does the mapping. So you can add richness of those things, but there's a, we, uh, even in the relational ones, we had the richness things. Theoretically, you can argue that with uh, mapping store in RDF, you can have even more rich representation, particularly if you have name relationships mm -hmm. and, and additional semantics to describe that. And perhaps even using external ontologies uh, to uh, have common terminology, common you know vocabulary, some other things of that nature. So those are the things that you add as a value. Is that what you're doing here, or something else? Exactly. Yeah. I think that's that's what we what we want to achieve. And I will actually speak a little bit more how we want to use this in enterprise settings in, uh, in a few slides. Mm. So next aspect is uh, sorry. It's Uh, storage and querying. 
Uh, so here I don't have so much on, the, on this topic, but there is a number of different um, uh, triple stores, meanwhile available, um, which have different uh, functionality, different characteristics. Some work in memory, some are very nicely uh, scale horizontally, so you can um, add more machines to a cluster and uh, scale this, or uh, some are hosted, like a startup from Berlin, for example, Dydra. Uh, you have different commercial offerings there. Um, it used to be still uh, by a factor 3 to 20 slower when we looked at the Berlin Spaco benchmark, for example. I think this decreased already. Like recently, there was the version 7 of Virtuoso released, uh, which was also developed in this LOD2 project, by the way. And um, there we really try to close this gap that you don't have a penalty anymore when you use a triple store compared to a relational database. Um, because a triple store, in a way, is schema last. You don't have to define a schema, right? You can just add triples, and then you can add structure like classes and properties and so on afterwards. Uh, that's something you cannot do in a relational database. There you have to define your schema up front, and then you fill the schema with data. That's a little bit the difference, and of course, all the indexing is optimized for having the schema up front. That's why we had some kind of a penalty uh, for RDF data management. Um, but um, meanwhile, I think there are approaches that you dynamically detect patterns and then you organize, reorganize the data according to the access patterns or according to the uh, schema which is discovered um, afterwards. And then you can achieve similar performance as with the relational database. Um, yeah, there are, we developed this uh, in order to uh, see really the differences. We created this DBPDA benchmark, uh, which is a selection of 25 most frequently executed queries against DBPDA from the public Sparkle endpoint. Um, and uh, then also different multiplies of DBPDA. Before, because uh, if you look at the Berlin Sparkle benchmark, it basically resembles a relational database. Yeah, you have like. Uh, tables with products, with customers, and, and links between those tables. And uh, we wanted to investigate how does it look when you really have a graph structure, like an RDF knowledge base, and DBpedia is exactly such a graph structure. It has not a very homogeneous structure, but very heterogeneous. You cannot actually um, load this into a relational database because it's so heterogeneous. And um, it turns out that um, when we did our performance comparison with the different triple stores, uh, that it in a way confirms uh, the ranking of the triple stores were similar as in the Berlin Sparker benchmark, but the differences were even accelerated. Like a uh, triple store which performed not so good uh, with the Berlin Sparker benchmark performed even worse with this highly graph structured data. So this was um, the, the storage and querying aspect, of course, I could, uh, you could talk, you know, have, have a whole talk only on that topic, but since it's not so much the focus of our research, uh, I didn't present you that much here. But we focus more is also on the authoring aspect. Uh, how can we actually create uh, or give people, a, a make a read-write uh, data web, right? Not only a read-only data web. Um, and one mm, aim or, or one approach uh, to this aim is using semantic wikis, there are like two kinds. There's, for example, semantic media wiki, uh, where you basically annotate information in the in the wiki text. Um, actually, the approach of semantic or media semantic media wiki wanted to get deployed at uh, Wikipedia as well, right? Then DBpedia would have become obsolete, but unfortunately, it, they didn't succeed because it was quite complicated with this triple store and this bunch of querying and everything, so that's why. But Semantic Media Wiki is a great tool if you have small to medium sized wikis, but for really large wikis like Wikipedia, it simply uh, doesn't scale that well. Yeah? You need more resources, more infrastructure, maybe two times more than with a standard wiki, which is not such a big problem um, if you have your server and you use only 50% or 20% of your server resources, then double the resource is not such a big deal. If you have something like Wikipedia, where you have thousands of servers, yeah, doubling the number of servers is a really substantial cost. And I think that was the reason why Semantic Wikipedia didn't get deployed at a Semantic Media Wiki at Wikipedia. Um, they started to develop actually something uh, something new, which is um, 
uh, Wikidata, right? So, which was the um, the technology which tried to overcome this performance uh, bottleneck and problem. And um, they made, I think, quite some progress. Unfortunately, uh, it's still not yet that uh, widely used as uh, as it should be to replace maybe a part of, of DBpedia. Uh, but another approach to this is actually um, authoring um, structured information right from the from the start, basically starting with the RDF data model, and that's what we do with OntoWiki, where you generate a form. And I want to show you some example of that, um, um, where we use that in an industrial setting at a company, um, uh, Daimler, which produces cars, like um, lots of different cars, like the most famous brand is Mercedes, which Daimler produces, yeah. And um, they have um, 250,000 employees. They have um, uh, roughly 100 billion revenue. Um, so they have 3,000 heterogeneous IT systems. Yeah, can you imagine 3,000 databases, ERP systems? For example, they have for each country they have a different ERP system. For the US, they have an ERP system, or maybe even several ones, because they produce drugs in the US. They produce cars. They have an ERP system for the US truck branch, for the US car branch. They have, of course, in Germany, in China, everywhere, they have different ERP systems. Yeah, And they try to consolidate, but uh, these are maybe 100 ERP systems. They consolidate them now to five or 10. Yeah, uh, But they still have lots of thousands of databases and other information systems. So, um, And it's impossible to integrate that all in one central database or data warehouse. It will be always. Um, uh, a plethora of different systems um, because once you started integrating it takes you several years maybe maybe it would take you 10 years to integrate it but once you're done there are already so many new systems out there which different departments started to use also they sometimes in such large organizations they sometimes fight against each other they not always work together right so uh, there are different uh, branches different subsidiaries different daughter companies and sometimes they compete with each other they don't want to um, use the same system as somebody else. Uh, they have sometimes quite some freedom in that. Um, at Volkswagen, we also work with Volkswagen, there it's even worse, they have 5,000 systems, not only 3,000. And there they have, for example, Audi, which is their premium brand, and Audi always does everything different than the rest of Volkswagen. Yeah? So um, they want to be ahead of the rest of the company, and that's why they want to do things differently. And I think if you want to be successful as a company, you have to give this freedom to certain branches in your organization that they can try out different things, that they can be more innovative. And once they uh, find a successful solution, then you can maybe roll this out or learn from their experiences. But what I want to say is that large organizations like these car manufacturers, but you also have maybe other, um, other examples, large um, manufacturers, large retailers, uh, which have lots of different branches, large financial institutions, orga large international organizations. Uh, for them, uh, it's very impossible to develop one single data model. And they have similar problems as we have on the web. They have a variety of different information systems, data structures, very much heterogeneity, and they need to integrate this. And I think linked data can provide, can help, as it helps on the web to integrate data, I think it can help in these large organizations um, to integrate data. So even at Daimler, for example, it's already a big problem to identify entities. Yeah. So um, they, for example, identifying um, a certain part, a look of a car, a location uh, of a factory, and in this factory, a certain location, and that's something they don't have unique identifiers for those things. So there are lots of departments like the logistics department and the production department and the strategy management. They all have different identifier systems or Excel sheets sometimes. Yeah, And uh, that's already a big problem in such large organizations. And I think here linked data, of course, can provide a lot of value because you have identifiers automatically for all the uh, data items and you can link to them. And I think the linked data approach is also a quite iterative, a bottom-up approach. You don't have to develop a huge ontology up front, but you can start by integrating a few information systems and then step by step it can grow and um, become um, like a, a, a movement in the company. So like a pay-as-you-go 
a strategy. And I want to show you one example, uh, which is actually deployed at the Mercedes-Benz website. So you can, I don't know if it's deployed at the US website, at a German website, um, you can actually see that. And they are in the process, I think, currently of rolling this out to all international websites. So uh, we integrated uh, two different um, in, uh, basically information systems. One is their enterprise taxonomy, and the other one is the car model database. So what you see here is onto wiki, it's this data wiki, and the car model database. Basically, for they produce lots of different variations of cars, right? So they have this database what uh, car models they, they offer. And um, for example, you see here often frequently uh, the name T model or the term T model appears here. Does any one of you know what the T model is? I also didn't know this. You know? Mercedes car? Hmm? Mercedes car? They are all Mercedes here. Oh. But what's a T model? It's a special type of car. It's actually a, a station wagon or a hatchback, combi, yeah? Uh, but internally, they always use T model. Uh, in, in Daimler, everybody speaks about T models. Nobody speaks about station wagon. Yeah, but it means station wagon, or in German, Kombi or hatchback. Yeah, and um, this is something um, which you have to make this connection actually. And that's why another. So here in the car model database, you also have the descriptions of the car, how much fuel they consume, how many, uh, what's the weight of the car, and so on and so forth. Um, and a uh, second um, information source which we imported is their enterprise thesaurus. They actually have a department of more than 10 people which manage a thesaurus of 50,000 terms in 20 different languages. Um, and there they of course have the concept team model and they have uh, the synonyms in different languages or the translations to different languages synonyms and uh, this information is available in the thesaurus. Previously, this was disconnected. The, the language management unit was working on the thesaurus. They were actually more librarians. And librarians, they want to preserve knowledge. They don't want to give it out. So uh, they were actually trying to hide their thesaurus from the rest of the company. <laughs> and, and then you had this car model database. And now we tried actually to make this connection. And we used um, this linking, silk, uh, for linking between the car model database and the thesaurus. And then the connection between T-model and the thesaurus concept T-model was made. And the thesaurus T-model concept then contains all the translations in different languages and synonyms and so on. Um, and this you can see on the website, so unfortunately it's not very, very bright, so like this. Um, uh, previously, if you entered, we had just keyword search. Um, now you can enter actually um, some, for example, C63 is a special type of car. I'm not a car aficionado, but there are lots of guys who know what C63, maybe also girls is. And they, of course, search for C63. In the full text search, you didn't find any any good if you found some documents where something was described but you didn't really find a car so that was really annoying them and what you can now do you can enter something and while you enter the term it actually searches this knowledge base the triple store executes sparkle queries and then offers you suggestions what could be meant with the search term so it's some search suggestion system and uh, which combines the thesaurus information with the car model database and other databases. They also have certain assistance systems. For example, when you drive in the dark, there is some kind of x-ray where you can see the, uh, the surroundings and these kind of things. Some people are interested in having this assistance system, but they don't know what car it is in. So you now can search for these kind of terms, and then you actually find really the cars which have these properties. And that was, um, was relatively easily possible. Uh, you can also now combine, for example, Combi in German, and then you find the T-model um, there. And here is this uh, assistant system, like Command is a special assistive system and where it's available. And these connections where the system is available is all now represented in this knowledge base. And they can also add more information and create new links if they find out. For example, in Germany there was biofuel at a certain point. Uh, biofuel was big discussed. And the term for biofuel was E10. That was the name. Yeah. When you search in the full text for E10, you don't find anything. 
Um, but everybody was actually doing that once, once it was debated uh, uh, in Germany. And then and now they can relatively easily connect these kind of search terms to elements in the knowledge base or to uh, assets. Okay, so that's a little bit the, the vision what we try to work on. Um, if you look at enterprise IT systems landscape, you have these thousands of information systems in large enterprises and only very few of them are connected. Of course, uh, the critical, critical systems like the CRM and the ERP system, they are connected, of, which are responsible also for the day-to-day -day production. Uh, but there are so many other information like um, different portals, different taxonomies, databases, wikis, and these are all disconnected currently and it's very difficult and the employees there spend a lot of time in also sending Excel sheets around by email, um, then consolidating different kind of Excel sheets and, and these kind of things and that could be facilitated if we could create more of these links between those different information systems. And, really create a network of information in this enterprise. And one um, crystallization point for this could be actually those taxonomies, like uh, large enterprises usually have some kind of enterprise taxonomy where they define the terms, the domain terms and domain knowledge already, and that could serve a little bit the same purpose as DBpedia for this web of data because uh, those taxonomies actually are connected to many of these information systems and they can be used as uh, linking hubs in a way to link to lots of different um, uh, additional information systems, portals, wikis. And another opportunity of course is you can also use uh, this knowledge from the web of data, right? So at Daimler for example they need also information for travel booking, they need information about all airport codes, right? Uh, so instead of um, creating all these airport codes anew, they can just obtain it from DBpedia for example. Also, the other way is very interesting for them. They also want to provide now information as structured data because um, they have this problem that they're, for example, this car model database, they want to publish this now as linked data on the web so that people pick up the data from them and not from third sources when people were mingling around with information. In the end, maybe the specifications don't match anymore. So they want to be the owner or uh, reclaim the ownership of, inf of their information in a way by also publishing structured data. And that's, of course, for them very interesting or important that information about those their products is accurate and is available widely. And that's something uh, which they will uh, also benefit by making this available as structured data. So we also uh, wrote some kind of vision paper about that together with this, this, these two guys here, for example, they work at Daimler. And um, so far we did two, three small prototypes, or, or not only prototypes, they are deployed already. But in the future we want to roll this out much more widely. And um, also at different uh, companies, so uh, next week, for example, I'm meeting People from Airbus, the competition of Boeing, uh, they are visiting us in Bonn. And uh, we have also a large broadcaster, public broadcaster, where we did some workshops. So I think this has a great potential. And um, of course, I, I would be very happy if you are interested in using linked data in the enterprise, enterprise settings, and if we could work together on that. So I had another example in the humanities, but maybe I skip this since we don't have so much time um, where we use OntoWiki in a completely different use case. Um, another important aspect is linking information, and of course we don't want to do this manually, but we have to automatize that if you have such a large taxonomy and a car model database, you don't want to create those links by hand, but you want to use the tool for that. Um, and that's what uh, Limes and Silk, for example, do. Um, uh, they try to reduce uh, basically the search space for creating those links because if you look at um, um, uh, like a brute force algorithm would compare every instance in one knowledge base with every instance in the other knowledge base. But this would, of course, require a uh, huge amount of comparison. So you want to optimize that. <coughs> And that's exactly what Alliance does um, and uh, reaches much more efficiency 
uh, by having uh, only comparing the certain exemplars and exploiting, for example, this triangle inequality or other strategies like blocking. So you have to do much less comparisons and you still find similar items in, um, in the knowledge bases. Uh, maybe I don't go so much into detail here. Another important aspect is enrichment. So do you know what this picture here has to do with enrichment? Is it uranium enrichment? Exactly. <laughs> it's uranium enrichment not in Iran. It's uranium enrichment in Los Alamos here in the US. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so where's actually uh, Liz Saida? She didn't come back. I asked her. Yeah. I hope she's not lost. I hope she's not lost. Actually, the car is over there. I see it from here. Strange. Okay, so um, enrichment, because we in link data, we focus on raw data, right? So, and this raw data has to be, we need upper level structure as well in order to have better search. And that's what um, um, we aim to to do with enrichment, linking it to upper level ontologies and um, uh, they are my colleagues, uh, Jens Lehmann, for example, and uh, Lorenz Bühmann, they will develop this tool Aura, which uses um, machine learning in order to learn ontology definitions for concepts from raw data. You can give examples, positive and negative examples, and it will learn a definition for these examples. Actually, Pascal Hitzler here from, from you uh, was very also closely working with Jens on that topic, learning, using ontology learning uh, for um, creating those upper level structures. Another aspect is quality analysis. Um, I think this is a very important aspect and we just started a new a project, research project, which one to, aims to more systematically focus on this um, because we have a very varying quality on the data web. Um, as we have on the web, right? You have very good quality on the web. You also have sometimes very bad quality and everything in between. The same we have on the data web. Um, um, uh, Peter Bühnemann from University of um, Edinburgh uh, famous, he's quite a famous guy in database research. He always says, yeah, link data is stale uh, because uh, he thinks the quality is not, not good. And in a way, he's right. The quality is not perfect as a, as a data, relational database, for example, where you have a schema up front and everything has to match the schema in order to fit in there. Um, but um, I think uh, uh, the challenge is of course, improving the quality, but also assessing the quality. Sometimes you don't need perfect quality. Uh, for example, let's take DBpedia. Um, I would nobody recommend to use it as a medical advisory system, the information in DBpedia, because there are, of course, things wrong and missing in DBpedia. It's extracted from Wikipedia. Maybe 10% of the information is not 100% precise. So for a medical advisory system, I would not use DBpedia. But uh, we did a project with a search engine. Um, there is a, the third largest search engine in Germany is um, Deutsche Telekom, who own T-Mobile, by the way, here in the US. Um, they just resell Google, the Google search, but they only get old features from Google. For example, instant search, or also this knowledge graph, that's something they don't, uh, cannot offer in their search. So they wanted to have something like the knowledge graph. Um, uh, and they approached it, it was uh, several years before, actually the Google knowledge graph didn't exist yet at that time. So we uh, developed something for them which was very similar uh, to the Google knowledge graph based on DBpedia. So when you searched for Angelina Jolie, it would actually show you, oh, it's an actress and she was playing in these movies together with these actors, which is information you can obtain from DBpedia. And if you don't get one of the movies Angelina Jolie was playing in, it's maybe not such a big uh, problem. Um, so for them, the quality was really sufficient. So we really created this prototype. They were very excited. They actually wanted to deploy that, but then they didn't manage to, they wanted to sell T-Mobile USA um, to at and maybe you remember, and then it was prohibited yeah, AT &T. by the... AT &T. Yeah, so they didn't manage to sell it, so they had to save a lot of money <laughs> because they already <laughs> planned uh, to, to this income from the sale of their US uh, subsidiary. And then they unfortunately stopped this project, but now we are starting to talk with them again and we can do something similar. So 
what I wanted to say is that um, the quality itself is not so much a problem. The problem is assessing the quality and finding out what can you expect from the data and is it sufficient for the use case or is it not sufficient and that's something uh, which we have to uh, research and try to establish those measures for assessing the authority, reliability of data web resources, maybe also en uh, employing crowdsourcing to improve the quality. Um, another aspect is evolution. Um, um, here we developed an approach for which it was inspired by software engineering which facilitates the evolution that you can automatically as you refactor software source code you can refactor your knowledge base and migrate your data um, but maybe I don't go so much into detail here and uh, the last um, thing is exploration uh, so do you know I have another guess for you what is what is this here Mars. No, <laughs> it has nothing, nothing to do with Mars. Something from, from mining or something. Yeah. Something from? To mine. To, no. It has something to do with space, so Mars is not, it's not completely wrong. It's like the moon. It's uh, called Luna Hot Adin. It's the Soviet moon, the first moon rover in the 50s, which explored the moon. And um, I'm showing you this because I think uh, we are in a similar situation right now with the Link Data Web. We have all these data out there, but there is no easy way yet to explore this. And that's something uh, which would be quite interesting to work on to intensify research. So my vision here is that we have some ecosystem of different visualizations and exploration techniques, browsing techniques, uh, which are bound maybe to the schema. So the data sets, they have certain they use certain properties. For example, a data set might, might use longitude and latitude. If there, the property longitude and latitude appears, it means it's spatial data, and then you can uh, display it on a map, right? And um, uh, if you have class, subclasses in the data set, you can create a taxonomy of the classes. And you actually can combine this uh, by showing you the map, and in addition, showing you a class hierarchy where you can drill down into certain classes and then only display objects of a certain type on the map. And uh, such kind of uh, things would be nice to visualize information um, in a domain-specific way or having different visualizations. And um, maybe I show you um, one example which connects to, uh, to Pablo's talk in the morning where we basically used um, a spotlight. So you have to open the new tab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of tabs open, <laughs> but I will hide them for, for me. So, so, so why does it not load? Ah, here it is. So this, um, what always annoyed me a little bit, although I was very, very excited about all these NLP research, uh, it was always a little bit annoying that you actually could never really see how this works. Like Pablo developed this user interface for the for Spotlight, where you can enter a text, right, and then you can click a button and you get the annotations. Uh, but I, what I was interested in was basically having a corpus of text and then clicking a button and getting different visualizations. And that's something uh, I told my colleague Ali Khalili, also Iranian um, PhD student. And uh, he developed then uh, this, this cool tool here where you can basically create a new corpus name. You can have different um, feeds or blogs or Twitter accounts or web pages or upload documents. And um, you can say the URL, uh, how many items you want to have, and uh, what kind of NLP service you want to use. And there we use uh, Pablo's uh, Spotlight tool. Um, and you can just, we can just click, let's look at uh, Barack Obama's tweets, for example. And then um, this context uses Spotlight to analyze all the tweets and to detect the named entities and uh, or uh, the entities and um, and all the the semantic do the semantic annotations and offers you different visualizations. Uh, so here, for example, we have faceted browsing. So we can go to faceted browsing, 
and it now uses um, Exhibit as a visualization tool in order to drill down into the uh, to explore this information. Unfortunately, it's a little slow. I'm sorry. And in addition to faceted browsing, you can also have a map uh, of the places which were mentioned in the tweets. You can create a timeline of the people which were mentioned in the tweets. You can create a tech cloud, um, visualize entity relationships. I'm sorry that it's um, so slow right now. It should be faster. Let me try to Here, uh, this, this one worked um, quicker. So that's basically, for example, entity trends. So it shows you the entities and then how trending they were. So uh, apparently, Barack Obama was tweeting a lot about gun violence in February, March, April, May. Then it was quiet, and then August again. Maybe there was some new incident, right, uh, related to gun violence. And um, about different kinds of, of Lincoln Memorial he mentioned in August and September. And so you can explore uh, this semantics which was extracted from the corpus in different ways. So let's see if the facility browsing, fortunately, still doesn't work. Let me show you some, some um, co-occurrence matrix. Uh, basically shows you what uh, terms appear together. Yeah? So you see this clustering of different terms. So Senate, um, GOP, Joe Biden, NRA apparently occurred together in tweets and um, um, here we use this data-driven documents like D3.js library for uh, visualizing basically the semantics which was extracted from this corpus. And then you can actually also really click on this um, and you see the articles, uh, oh, I'm sorry, here in that case, you don't, you, you should be able to see the articles which mention Washington and, and fact together. Yeah, I'm sorry, but this um, but this doesn't work here. The fact browser. So basically, what it shows you is um, you can have a faceted browser. You see, uh, basically, you can look at all the tweets about people or about places or about organizations, and even about what kind of people. For example, since we use Spotlight. It, it knows when a person is a politician or when it's a scientist. So you can actually select, I want only select tweets of Barack Obama about scientists. Ah, now, now it works, yeah? So here we have these different types. So um, I was talking about person, it's still loading. Here it loads basically all the tweets and you see, uh, you can uh, look at person and then you can see artist and you can quickly see what artist did Barack Obama tweet about, yeah? So Jay Leno, and uh, so you can quickly explore information in different ways and um, find, and uh, that's something you can do with your own blog if you want, or with your own Twitter account, and uh, within a few minutes you can analyze the data and you can explore your data in these, these new ways. And that's something um, which only can, is possible when we have such tools as, as Spotlight, DBP, the Spotlight. Okay, so now Seite is back, and um, the second thing I wanted to show you at this point, or was actually uh, a quick example of what what Seite is doing. If we still, how much time do we have? Do we have ten more minutes? Then maybe Seite, you can can show the um, the question answering part. So Seite is working on how we can explore the data by giving natural language uh, questions to uh, 
um, and, and then uh, translate these kind of questions into formal queries, into Sparkle queries, and an underlying knowledge base. Let's keep it short. Of course, as they have lots of sensitive information, they don't want to share it. Even uh, they were, there were even some lawyers when they talked to Daimler, they said, oh, that's very bad. When you integrate all the information, that's really bad. Because in the US, we always get this, how is it, class, uh, class, 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 class actions. Yeah. So if they can integrate all the data in our company, then they will quickly find out things which we didn't know, and then we will get sued. <laughs> <laughs> So that was uh, something they were scared about, but I think the benefits outweigh those disadvantages. So, and of course, if they can prevent certain things from happening, certain mistakes or production mistakes by integrating data, then that's a big benefit, right? And, but you are very right, so that's actually something we have to focus on also on access control. Um, because even in large companies at Volkswagen, they have 10,000 different access groups. There are 10,000 different privilege groups of users in the company. And you actually have to indicate for each data item or database uh, what is the privilege level and who has access to them. And that's something which I think is still also an issue for research. So we found out that current triple stores don't support this very well. Um, having such access uh, control profiles. And and, uh, my colleague Ben has done uh, work on access control. Uh, perhaps we can talk about that. But access control uh, probably needs to be implemented at various levels, all the way down to the level of which which triple really can be used by by different, uh, different users. Ben, did you want to comment? I have a question. Yeah. Um, one question from the board is, uh, um, is the OSM mapping to IDF data, is it available? Yeah. yeah. There is this website linkgeodata.org mm -hmm. and there everything is available. Like uh, we also produce data sets and uh, mappings and the source code of the Sparkly <coughs> Spotify tool. Okay. And the second question is about the assessing the quality. So that's the work that you are starting on. Exactly, that's thing. something we are starting. So what we did so far with um, with Amra Pali, she we did a survey of different quality metrics for linked data. Right. Um, and we are currently on the process of publishing the survey and then as a next step, so this will happen in the next six, eight months that we develop a tool uh, which actually allows to measure the quality in terms of these metrics. It will not be quality is good or bad, but it will be rather uh, has a lot of links, it has so exactly. so many exactly. cover zones, so many right. uh, different classes, and uh, you will get more a set of indicators which help you to assess finally whether it's sufficient for your use case or not. Right. I'm really interested in understanding that because uh, I'm interested in figuring out what are the metrics that, I mean, what is the way to come up with, that's one. And number two, it's contextual. Uh, something will be good or something will be bad in different contexts, like, or the quality is going to differ depending on the context. So which properties are usually taken as a common base to say that uh, it's a good or it's a good quality, it's fairly good quality or fairly okay quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, America. data 
So based on how many we pick up from this list, uh, we can generate different interpretation of those uh, disaggregated resources. Um, I mean, as so far as very based on those disaggregated resources. So, and here is some sample of electric resources of running these as far as for instance, the name of the southern fluids in Spain. So, any questions? So, the, the obvious uh, bottleneck would be the ability to disambiguate the entities of the query. Yes, yes. yes. Um, uh, how, how, the, 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 oh, this is obviously a, a, simple, a single example uh, where it works, uh, but uh, have you ass assess that, that difficulty? Of, yeah, how, do you, how do you resolve that? Talking about the navigation is very long discussion. <laughs> I don't have time, <laughs> but I can refer you to some uh, papers if you're interested. Uh, well, I'm familiar with the work. Uh, Tan Tren did some work on ontology driven uh, semantic search in which uh, there was very limited context in the search queries, where he used description logics on the background knowledge to read uh, to do this ambiguity. I was just wondering how you would address uh, that issue. But there is enough time, so you can take that off. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah, we should do, uh, you know, just discuss this maybe even after that. There's some people interested. We had also done a proposal on uh, question answer involving the uh, link data uh, with uh, men and guys. So I, I think we have some exposure there. Who was, who was, who was in that proposal? Uh, none of us worked on the proposal, but I have read the proposal. Pratik did that. Okay, I just want to conclude then quickly. Um, so, what Seidel was showing you was some approach also for exploration of the data, similar as the context application. Uh, so, I, I think there are a lot of different um, applications of these different aspects and tools and these aspects in the enterprise. So, here are some. Some examples, database integration, XML schema governance, enterprise taxonomies, uh, wikis and portals, uh, intranet search, uh, also one very important one. And um, we integrated different of those tools. Some of those tools I presented, like Spotlight, for example, also Virtuoso, the wiki, the auto wiki, they are available as Debian packages, as open source, uh, and you can actually install them. Uh, they are called LOD2 stack on a Debian Ubuntu system, for example, or Debian-based system relatively easily. At uh, stack.lod2.eu, you will find more information about, uh, about the tools. And ultimately, I hope that uh, this can contribute closing this gap between unstructured information management and structured information management. I think currently it's a little bit separated. Uh, you have, of course, for structured information management, you have SAP, Oracle, uh, Sage, Salesforce, different uh, systems. Uh, SAP strategy, of course, is to integrate everything into SAP, which they succeed for to a certain extent, but not everything is in SAP, is representable in SAP, right? And uh, so they never succeed completely. And then for this unstructured information management, we have search like. Um, Microsoft Fast or Solar, Scene, Exalit, Autonomy, which do basically keyword search on an intranet and uh, access different kind of sources on the intranet and link data maybe can uh, bridge between the two and especially technologies like Spotlight um, or also this question answering once we have more link data source in the enterprise and you can actually answer natural language questions and you get information integrated from different sources uh, that's then, I think, a big, uh, big advantage. And uh, this way, I think, link data can uh, can complement service-oriented architectures, provide some uh, additional easy entry to service-oriented architecture. Uh, you can leverage background knowledge and make, hopefully, enterprise information integration more flexible, iterative, and uh, cost-efficient. And that's um, what what I will try to work on in the next um, next years. Uh, to deploy more of these tools, and um, so uh, we also try with, with our group from Leipzig, and then we'll try to do the same now in Bonn to make all these tools available as open source. Next, for example, showed you how it can work. Uh, Pablo uh, published Spotlight as open source, and 
provides it as a service, and then we could put this visualization and exploration uh, very easily on top. And, uh, of course, there are many people involved. So here's the, the team from, from Leipzig, uh, which you see. Uh, my new team and bond is just in the build-up phase, so there are not yet that many. And of course, in the linked open data project, there are also many more people involved, um, uh, which you see. Some of them you see here. This guy, for example, here's Peter Bond. She's um, one of the guys uh, behind the column store, uh, MonetDB, which inspired Virtuoso, the triple store, and actually also SAP's HANA, the in-memory database. Uh, they learned a lot from Peter, and uh, this here is Ori Erling. Uh, he's a Finnish guy uh, from Finland, living in the Netherlands. He's blind, but he's the most one of the most brightest people I've ever met. Yeah, he's programming, he's developing this virtuoso triple store, and um, without um, having uh, seen anything. So that's really amazing how how Ori does that. He actually was studying with the same guys who developed. MySQL and InnoDB, which were acquired now by Oracle, so he, they were all Finnish, right, or from Sweden, Finland, so he all knows those guys, and he developed his own database, which became this virtuoso triple store. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and for the questions, and Saida and me, we will still be here today, tomorrow, so if you have any questions or want to discuss something in more detail, um, please don't hesitate to approach us. Did, Thank you. You, did you get any discount from Mercedes by doing, you know, from, from Mercedes? Mercedes. Mercedes. Oh, Mercedes. <laughs> no? No. <laughs> That's too bad. But they were paying us for, oh. uh, like a small car, they paid us for developing this. <laughs> ah, <okay. laughs> if the university would allow us to spend this money for a car, we could afford it. <laughs> A small Mercedes car. Uh, the smallest one. <laughs> <laughs> More like a smart. <laughs> no, but they, they actually plan right now, they are discussing, so they, it's also a very big company, so it takes them a long time until they invest in something. But after they now saw uh, that it is quite beneficial and quite flexible, they are thinking about investing several million now in linked data technology in the next two years. Of course, not only in us, but also internally building up a team there and so on. Uh, but uh, that might happen in the next one or two years that they actually uh, do much more in that regard and uh, invest much more in the technology. Other questions? I guess we discussed most of the questions already during the talk. So I was surprised that you know uh, Mercedes they were actually you know uh, using the triple store on their uh, front end because usually on the UI part right it really require you know response within I don't know a few hundred uh, milliseconds I mean was that an issue can it respond very yeah we easy? actually deployed some caching there so when you enter the same search term twice you uh, it's actually cached so I can okay. show you you can go to Mercedes Benz DE and then you can enter here. The search term, C63, sorry, C. you see while I'm typing, it already offers me here the results. Oh, Just I see, I see, okay, okay. I guess I have to decrease the, but you can try this yourself. And But we cache, of course, when you enter C63 twice, uh, the Spark query is only executed the first time, and then subsequently the results from the previous uh, query are reused. Got it. For the first query, is that... Uh, and if you, of course, you can still do the full text search. So if you click here on search, you actually get to the full text search. And that's where you got, that's, that's how it looked before, yeah? So, oh. of course, this is very, a little bit annoying if you search for a nice car and then you get a list of, of these kind of documents here at the URL. So that's what they were also annoyed with. And now I think it's much much nicer. Yes, yes, yes. Without the caching, usually how much time does it take for the first time when you use it? Oh, it's still very fast. Also, we have, I have to say it's not big data there. It's actually small data. Yeah, The car model database is a few hundred thousand triples, if at all, maybe even less than 100,000. And uh, OK, the enterprise taxonomy, it's 500,000 concepts. Let's say every concept has 20 triples, then it's um, how much? Mm -hmm. 10 million triples, yeah, but it's not big data. 10 million fits uh, by far in main memory, so this is all 
uh, very relatively fast. So I actually think everybody talks about big data. Is it here the same in the US? In Europe, it's like a huge topic, right? Big data. It is. It is still here. I think actually uh, small data is the real challenge, yeah? <laughs> not big data. Big data is relatively easy when you have it, when it's homogeneously structured. But if you have thousands of small data sources, then it gets very challenging. And of course, once you integrate them, then it becomes also big data. But That's the variety challenge of big data. Exactly. So, okay, uh, linked open data. In terms, of if, if I look overall in the presentation, it's more, uh, uh, Types uh, of entities have been utilized, but uh, I don't see like uh, I don't see a very good use case normally, which is quite quick to use the relationships. Most of the relationships in the linked data, so uh, kind of they use types or they directly use just the graph of linked open data. But already different labels and different languages are relationships, right? Or no, we use it, for example, in the in this context for when you look at the persons. So when it detects, for example, people from Spotlight, um, politicians and blog posts, right? And then it actually accesses Wikipedia and finds information about those people and their birthplaces and death places. And then you can visualize it on a timeline. So there you really have relationships between different entities. But I agree. So. The relationships maybe are not yet that exploited, so that's actually an that's, interesting topic. That's normally computationally a little more intensive than just using graphs. So other than enterprises, um, information management have used in any other context uh, use of the similar LOD approach? Like in, like you said, digital humanities. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, there we worked in, in Leipzig. Leipzig is the second oldest university in Germany, so the historians, they created a large knowledge base with all the professors working in Leipzig in the 600 years. And they used this data wiki in order to add all the information there. So that was another example, which I didn't have time now to present in all detail. But we also worked, for example, with Walters Kluver, a publisher. Um, they want to, um, they have lots of customers in the legal accounting tax uh, domain, like lawyers, attorneys. And uh, uh, traditionally, of course, they sell books, but a lawyer doesn't really want to, he has a specific question. He wants this question to be answered, or a tax professional. He wants to know what's the value added tax in Delaware, right? And he wants to get quickly 0%. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't want to read big books. So that's something which Walters Kluver actually wants to change their content management uh, <coughs> processing and, and editing uh, chains so that they can have more structured content that they can answer these questions more specifically and deliver really information at the fingertips of those professionals who want them and not having big documents or books and articles. So we worked with them, we developed also their prototype, uh, but there it's not yet deployed, so that's still in the, in the works. Uh, so. I have a question regarding the, the, the you know the difference between say the, the um, relational database and the semantic web uh, web you know like linked open data because with the help of D2R right say I have a relational database and instantly it will become a uh, LD exactly. data set yeah. so uh, so my question is in your opinion you know what are the most important features about you know LOD that makes it so different from you know the traditional relational database. Yeah, the most important feature is something uh, which everybody will laugh about, but I think it's um, it's really crucial. It's that you have those identifiers for the data items. It's a very simple thing the database community is laughing about. Uh, as also, when I defended my PhD thesis 10 years ago, no, when was it, 2006? So seven years ago, yeah, the database professor in Leipzig, he was saying, so we are doing this already for decades. like representing data, different data models, so what's the big uh, big deal here? And he didn't really understand, or for him, this URIs, of course, it's a small small difference, but I think it's uh, it has a huge impact and huge effect, because once you have those URIs, and you, the URIs are not only identifiers, they are also access paths to the data. You can actually retrieve the data from the URI. 
and that has a huge benefit, I think, especially in a company that you can really retrieve the information, get the most recent version, link it via the zero eyes together. Um, it's, I think, from the scientific perspective, a relatively small thing, but from the impact in the real world, I think it has a huge, huge impact. Uh, then, besides the you know the UI, what else do you think uh, you know very important? And then, of course, that you have those vocabularies, you can easily mix and mash different vocabularies, ontologies, um, like the traditional or the answer of the last 10 years. So the data integration problem is usually XML schema and XML, right? XML technologies. But in XML, it's much more difficult if you have different schemas, different version of the schemas, to create an integrated schema. In RDF, you can just reuse one URI or one class identifier. You don't have to use the whole ontology. You can easier mix and mesh uh, identifiers from different namespaces, from different vocabularies. Uh, than it, uh, and then, of course, the data model. If I give all of you the task to develop an XML schema for representing information about people, yeah, every one of you will come up with a different schema. One will use tags in, uh, with uh, sub-tags or with attributes or with text nodes, right? In XML you have very much um, express, or you can do many different things, but the semantics is unclear. What does it mean being an attribute of a tag? There is not really the defined meaning or being um, inside a tag, put a tag inside another tag, right? What is the meaning? It belongs together, but how the relationship between the two is, is not really clear. In RDF, you actually only have subject predicate object, SPO triples. Um, you are very limited. You don't have so much expressivity as in XML, but on the other hand, it's relatively clear what the semantics is. The entity identified by the subject has the property identified by the predicate with the value identified by the object, right? So, and if I ask you to create an RDF schema for people, you might have different identifiers, different URIs, but the basic structure will be the same, right? You come up with first name, last name, birth date, uh, and, and so, so I think it will be relatively easy to map between your different schema. Probably in most cases, we just have to map between the URIs saying this is the same as this one, yeah? First name and given name is the same, but in this XML schema, it's, it's much more difficult, this mapping. And I think that's also a great benefit of RDF. That's a very simple data model, um, and uh, which doesn't give you, it allows you to do a lot of things, but uh, the semantics is relatively clear. Um, but like, so to, to the point only, the semantics is clear. I think that is still is shallow in a way, because uh, here again, like for all of, if all of us are designing our uh, RDF schema, and then we are just, uh, we again have a mess in the linked open data that we put a lot of data set with a schema which is driven by us, our concept model, and then we have this again problem of uh, syncing between synchronizing my RDF <coughs> model with Blue's RDF model on the uh, RDF model. So the, the problem is, of I course, it in a way. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, yeah. As Pablo phrased it, the bloodline doesn't all uh, doesn't solve all your extraction problems. Link data doesn't solve all your integration problems. Yeah, you still have to. But uh, I think it simplifies many things. Already, so we can say that one step closer. We are one step exactly. closer in terms of resolving yeah, it. Yeah. When you're more simple, Maybe analyze. giving you the tools to um, <coughs> achieve the integration in an easier way than. Then, uh, with leaders. traditional XML or traditional techniques. I have a follow-up question. I think a lot of them are in the, in the steps where they're choosing topics uh, to work on, right? And uh, from your presentation, I could see that uh, linked data, uh, which was basically discussed on the web, now you're looking into linked data enterprise. In enterprise, which brings new challenges there. You're also looking at uh, uh, data quality and big data. So these these are some of the topics that I think you believe are promising, but those are some that you are actually looking into. I wonder if you had any topics that you don't plan to work on, but that you think uh, will be hot or are interesting for people that are starting their their work uh, on linked data. And perhaps I should have started this question with. Do you think that linked data on the web is dead, or has it hit a plateau of this disillusionment? <laughs> what is the name of that? You know, the, uh, the hype cycle? Yeah, right, right, right. Right, so like, yeah. it's a right. so, like, do you think 
that it's too late to start with the recession link data, uh, and if not, which are the topics that you think that people uh, should consider? Yeah, I think the, the, what you mentioned definitely the quality uh, then in enterprise enterprise aspects. Um, for example, some one topic which I find very interesting is also how can we bring schema XML schema that's something related to enterprises and RDF actually together because that's what you usually when you go to big companies they have lots of schemas XML schemas and they use XML schemas for data integration right now already. Now we come with RDF, so how, and we don't want, of course, to get rid of all the XML schemas. They should stay there, but we also uh, want, in addition, maybe new things should be integrated using RDF. So how could we bring this together, having <coughs> governance of developing approaches for governing XML schema or for addressing the information in the XML schema and RDF? So that, that could be a, something interesting bridge between those two worlds, between schema, XML schema and, and RDF. Uh, his first question is still yeah. unanswered. Is linked open data <laughs> on the web this day? <laughs> I think it has. Uh, we only started to see, uh, or especially, if, I think in enterprises, it, it can be a, become a huge wave. That, yes. Uh, for example, the big players in enterprise information management and integration, like SAP, IBM, uh, where Pablo now is working, they didn't even start looking at leaked data, right? So, uh, what I'm trying now, also there are some partners, there are some companies we work with, or with some examples, um, uh, creating some showcases, and I think once we have some really uh, bigger showcases, then maybe those big players will get interested, and then a huge wave of linked data will roll through. Maybe now they are busy with the big data wave, right, still, <laughs> but once the big data wave goes down, maybe then they get interested in, in linked uh, data. So I, I think, think uh, this big wave, from my perspective, didn't even start in the enterprises yet. So. In the enterprises... It's, it's they, kind of, uh, yeah, like, just my intuition, right? Uh, it's like, it's easier to come to a consensus in terms of building a linked data application with a schema for an enterprise, but shifting that to a web where there are, uh, you know, different kind of people where the quality is from, you know, A to Z, it is, it might be really tough to come up with applications on the web for linked data. Is that kind of, does that? Well, the solution to this might be to add uh, provenance, right, so that the, the quality of the facts on linked open data can be spoken for by the authors of those facts. Uh, and so people can develop their, their applications by, by exhibiting trust based on the sources that contribute to uh, that knowledge. Yeah. That may be a, a sort of a patch or Quick fix See, I think this is your point related with the quality metric. So what could be the most common quality metrics of this? Because it's very contextual. Some things will be very good for uh, some of the data properties. Um, I think they're going to be very useful in some of the context, contextual applications. But some of the contextual applications may not be the same case. So the LD2 project has uh, uh, worked on data quality. It was written by a very handsome gentleman. <laughs> that you guys should read. The I think we should submit it right here. So, um, <laughs> so the, the thing that happens in these cases is uh, invariably simple things get happen first. And with the simple things, there is a lot of hype. And then you realize the complex things uh, that uh, are, you know, the part of life and that uh, are that don't get solved ever or until after decades. Just to give you one example, uh, yesterday in the talk there was this discussion about um, a mapping. I brought up the issue about, you know, in in. 80s, and I remember when uh, Vito Litwin was working on this, and I was working. We used to have, uh, you know, this concept of four different types of mappings. Map, you know, um, uh, mappings that are that can be directly defined, that are equality, a variety of different things you can talk about in terms of participation of this member with that member, and mappings that can be defined using a table in the middle, and mapping, you know, that is arbitrary this object map to this object through the intermediated thing 
mappings that can have constraints in them, mappings that can have functions, arbitrary functions in them, right? And after so much time in linked data, I have not talked about anybody as far as, and I could be, I'm sure I, you know, I don't have 100% literature over you, but uh, at least the ones that I come across is nobody who has looked at all that work um, that were done two or three decades ago about the generic aspects of mapping is a complexity of mappings. So we have had, what, five, six, seven um, uh, ontology mapping uh, workshops, right? Um, and all of them deal with trivial set of mappings, right? They are the mappings that uh, the ontology alignment, uh, you know, challenge does is practically trivial and is practically useless. Okay, from a real world context, you look at the corporate enterprise databases, and you try to <coughs> map the two things in the enterprise databases. These are these simple trivial mappings that are in the ontology alignment. I think are just not going to go anywhere. So, the real world uh, aspects it was a lot more complexity. They there is a mapping between this and this within a particular context, as an example. So if you go back to, if you look at the so far yes, so near paper, right? I hope you guys, if you're working on mapping, I have you looked at that. It talked about having um, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, context of the mapping described using ontology or other model. It talks about the complexity of the language uh, is used in the mapping, right? Because you could define mapping, you're going to use a language. It talks about um, the schema level mapping and abstractions, right? Like subtype of or whatever those things. And it talks about um, uh, instance level of the things, right? So these are all fundamental things, right? And look at that comprehensiveness that we uh, of the mappings that we have described. Uh, this is uh, so far so so near so far schematically so near uh, you know the keynote or the Kashyap you know shared paper on real vision of 1996, and I don't see and these are well known things. These mappings are there with real world examples, and if at all, linked open data and or essentially the semantic web representation of data has more richness of data representation. That means the potential for representing mapping is even richer than before. And yet we have not even caught up with the richness of mappings that was being done two decades ago. Right? So what happens here is that we keep on postponing, we keep on, you know, all these things uh, with early, we want to we, we people publish paper, but the complex and the real challenges uh, are simply not addressed. And then where, while that is not addressed, you're not going to find real world applications, especially in the corp, you know, enterprise setting. Search is different, right? Search is always easier uh, in one sense. Search, uh, search, big issue is scalability. But otherwise, who is the consumer of search? Human. And human is extremely smart. And so, uh, you know, uh, whatever are the limitations of a search technique in terms of semantics, human is able to take care of it. It knows, you know, human looks at this 10 and uh, looks 50 is the most relevant one. Where is it coming from? And all the different contextual information human has in the mind. What is what the human looks for? is in the mind, it's not given to search engine. But when you try to feed these results to anything programmatic, or any software, or any enterprise user who has to make a decision, uh, you know, uh, with uh, supported data, the issues, uh, you know, quality needs to be much better. The richness needs to, be, needs to be much better. And this is when the kind of simple solutions that we come up with in terms of mapping and data quality and other things simply uh, don't work. So the hard work either one has to put in to get them to real use, or we kind of uh, have high, I mean, publishing the data is simple. We publish what? We had two billion triples. We publish in link sensor data, right? Because we wanted a big bubble for ourselves. But what does it do, right? I mean, uh, it, so, yeah, Cory. <laughs> Cory graduated. <laughs> <laughs> so it was Herschel's uh, job, right? So that's, you know, we, we can all do that. Everybody's done that. But the you know, hard work is to actually publish with all the richness, to have a schema, what, you know, Pratik did, he realized that you know, just by putting more knowledge in schema, I can come up with better instance level mapping. Right? And um, then uh, you, uh, uh, you have to map with each other. So uh, when you try to map with somebody else's data, you don't have full context. They are not represented. They don't have details given. 
So there is very hard, it's very hard to come with those mappings. So if you're going to really use these things, you need the richness. Uh, richness in terms of modeling and mapping and uh, then you can say this is same or similar or you know related and relevant. I don't know if you remember the concept, you know those concepts that were defined a long time ago. Similar, exactly similar, um, you know subtype, supertype, right? Uh, uh, related and relevant. At humans, you know, think related and relevant, do you understand generally what it means? Mathematically, they are incredibly complex, or could be very complex. But, th but that, you know, in a such context, human mind say, knows it is relevant or related. In a, math in a way where which has to be submitted and used, consumed by somebody else, by software or uh, a program or, uh, uh, you know, in a decision-making context, well, then you really have to solve, and then issues are not solved. So these are the kind of, you know, uh, there's a, so there will be a lot of heavy lifting to be done to make um, linked data uh, useful for real applications, right? And, and again, as I said, there, there, is, there are some real applications that are more like search and browsing and the human is an integral part of the process. They, for that, this is good, this is great, right? You know, Wikipedia, human is reading that. From that you take some data and put in Wikipedia and, you know, if you use in search, yes, that is very, very useful even now. Go beyond search kind of stuff, and you will run into trouble. And that, that's where uh, hard work needs to be done. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this thing. All right, well, guys, uh, so formally end this talk. Thank you very much, sir. Let's make some coffee, and uh, I, I'll, I'll give you pods. Anybody wants to make coffee and uh, feed our uh, guest, and then uh, maybe uh, some of you can uh, meet with uh, Saida and discuss. Uh, you know, if you guys want to, uh, some question answer and other things like that in details. Um, and um, uh, Pablo.